last week, if you remember, we talked about um, the people who party on. They eat and drink, and they're they're enjoying life. And uh, then God comes on this swift cloud, and uh, what's that? Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah 23. Um, so we're going to pick it up in 23, which is uh, part of that section uh, that we did last week. Um, but we must press on. So this is an oracle concerning Tyre and Sidon. Uh, of course, Jesus mentions Tyre and Sidon uh, and doesn't have the nicest things to say about them. Uh, these are Phoenician cities, and Isaiah uh, in this oracle says they're going to be laid waste. Um, again, God is sovereign over everything, every one. Um, God is not just the God of the Israelites. Um, God is the God of the universe. And so his justice applies equally to everybody. Um, you can't escape it. Um, and one of the sayings that, that I think just rings very true is you cannot understand the love of God um, unless you understand the justice of God. And you cannot understand the justice of God unless you understand the love of God. Uh, justice doesn't make sense unless you understand why, uh, what God's divine purpose is um, in meeting out justice. So, uh, chapter 23, I'm going to read. Um, uh, I'll read just a little bit of this, um, starting in verse 1. The oracle concerning Tyre. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is laid waste without house or harbor. From the land of Cyprus it is revealed to them. Be still, O inhabitants of the coast, the merchants of Sidon, who cross the sea, uh, have filled you. And on many waters your, your revenue was the grain of, uh, of Shihor, the harvest of the Nile. You are the merchant of the nations. Be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea has spoken. The stronghold of the sea, saying, I have neither labored nor given birth. I have neither reared young men nor brought up young women. When the report comes to Egypt, there will be an anguish over the report about Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish. Well, O inhabitants of the coast. This is your exultant city, whose origin is from days of old, whose fleet carried her... Whose, um, is this your exultant city, whose origin is from days of old, whose fleet carried her to settle... Um, far away. Who has purposed this against Tyre? The bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honored of the earth. The Lord of hosts has purposed it. To defile the pompous pride of all glory, to dishonor all the honored of the earth. Um, I, I, think, I think it's important to point out that you know, Isaiah is highlighting uh, the prominence of, of this area. Um, this area was, um, they were, it, it was a trade center, uh, big port cities. So they had ships constantly in and out. Uh, lots and lots and lots of wealth. Uh, this was a very wealthy area. Um, there was a lot of honor and prominence. This was a very well-oiled machine. So this wasn't like a bunch of slackers just, you know, having all this wonderful thing, all these wonderful things to just drop in their lap. These were hard workers. Um, these were noble people. And, um, you know, I think it just demonstrates, uh, Isaiah demonstrates that um, when you're wicked, none of that matters. Uh, your wealth doesn't matter. Your big powerful ships don't matter. Um, your beautiful ports don't matter. Uh, your once uh, honored lives don't matter. No, that's right. Um, you know, it's, it's such a human thing to take security in wealth and power. And, uh, you know, you look, again, not, not to be political in this political season, but you look at what power does to people. 
Um, there are no rules for people. It is the wild west. Um, and it's not just our government. It's every government. Um, and that's, I think, my opinion is from all spectrums, from diehard communism, socialism, um, even anarchist nations. Anything goes. When there's power, there's dominance. Uh, when there's dominance, there's pride, arrogance. Um, and you just become, you think you're invincible. Um, and God sends a very healthy reminder, you're not invincible. Um, God is still sovereign. God is still supreme. God is, uh, God has the power uh, to bring down wrath. Um, and he will. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a sober reminder. Um, and then he goes on, verse 14, it's, uh, this begins another section. We're starting 15. Uh, Tyre is going to be forgotten. And um, Isaiah uses this metaphor. She becomes this prostitute. Um, but instead of collecting her own wages, she's going to be paying for the righteous people of, of Israel. Um, and so she's, you know, Tyre is um, selling herself out. Um, in a whole lot of ways. And so instead of, you know, collecting the, the reaping the benefits of that, the money from that, um, it's going to be handed over to Israel. God's going to strip it from them. Uh, verse 15, in that day Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years uh, like the days of one king. At the time of, uh, at the end of 70 years it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the prostitute. Take a harp, go about the city, O forgotten prostitute. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that you may be remembered. And at the end of seventy years, the Lord will visit Tyre, and she will return to her way, return to her wages, and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Her merchandise and her wages will be holy to the Lord. It will not be stored or hoarded, but her merchandise will supply abundant food and fine clothing for those who dwell before the Lord. So I guess um, I guess a question is, uh, is a rhetorical question, but does God use horrible circumstances to bring about um, good things? Does God bless those horrible circumstances? You see it time and time again. That's a rhetorical question. Uh, the one that's not so rhetorical is how often does God do that? And is God still doing that lots and lots today? I think I think that's part of the problem is we we Christians are so tuned into negativity and it's, it's there's no room for good n for for the good news anymore because we're so negative, and everything is doom and gloom, and everything we're, you know, we may as well just give up, and um, it's crazy. Um, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. When we open our eyes to it, um, we see good coming out of horrible, horrible things all the time. Not only good, but you see God blessing it, um, and that's a really difficult concept. Uh, I think for us to understand, and, and we're not the only ones, you know, Habakkuk, um, one of the most famous um, arguments in Scripture with God, why are you doing this? God comes back, I'm going to raise up those Babylonians, that ruthless nation, to be my strong arm and to come in and, and to carry out this swift judgment on my people. And Habakkuk is absolutely, utterly shocked by that. Why did God do it? God did it to bless Israel. And there's this remnant that came out of that. Uh, you know, for me, it, I know this is going to sound really bad. For me, it doesn't really matter. Um, whether God allows it or whether God directly causes it. And I think he does both of those. Um, 
I think that, you know, it's sometimes it's really hard for us to decipher. Is God causing this or is God allowing this? Um, which either way, God, God has a hand in it. You know, there was a question that was asked to me and we took a class uh, called Providence and Suffering uh, when I was in graduate school. And one of the questions that, that my professor asked uh, the class, he said, is God indictable? We were going through the book of Job. Is God indictable? Can we indict God and say, God, you're responsible for this. You're responsible for the death of Job's family. Uh, you're responsible for um, uh, everything of his being wiped out. Everything. Um, is God indictable? And the conclusion you have to draw is yes, absolutely. Uh, you know? Mm-hmm. That's right. Job does indict God. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think I think too and this is this is where we get tripped up and and we we get so uh, bogged down. I still don't think that Job got it even after God revealed himself and Job comes back and says, I now repent in dust and ashes. Um, it, Job falls down in complete submission um, to God. And I, I don't think he still was like, oh, well, you know, cool. Now I know why you killed my whole family. Um, I don't think Job ever figured that out in his lifetime. It's not a happy ending story. Um, but Job fell down in complete submission to God. And, I, you know, I heard a perfect analogy the other day. Um, you know, I spent a little bit of time with, uh, with John Euler, and he, he said um, something clicked with him, and he, he remembered seeing... Um, something at a pet store or something where um, people just pick up the mice by the back of the neck and they just move them. And he said, you know, he said, I'm at a point in my life where I'm, I'm that little mouse and God just reaches down and he's like, it's the point when you're picked up and he's like, and it doesn't hurt the mice. They're not squeaking. That's just, they're, that's how they're moved. So you move from this cage to this cage and plop. And he's like, it's that moment when you feel you're being lifted up that you lose total control over everything in your life and you have to fully submit and just be like, oh, okay, we're moving over here. <laughs> All right, God, uh, you put me here, now what? Um, and I thought it was a perfect analogy. And I think Job was at that point. I don't think Job is like, oh, awesome. Well, <laughs> Now I have all the answers, God. I'm cool with that. I don't think Job was ever there. Uh, but I think Job, um, Job just saw God moving him around and, and, and Job submitted. Um, and Job did indict God. Um, and not only was God okay with that, uh, but God rips Job's friends who were trying to justify God. They were coming back and saying, no, 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 don't, don't say anything about, you, you know, you must have done something to make God mad. Uh, they're looking for this big, deep reason. There wasn't really a reason, at least not a good one. Not, not from our perspective, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Catastrophic. Yeah, we have all the all the words. Yep. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Right. <laughs> Let it flow. Let it flow. <clears throat> Yeah. Right, sure. Yeah. No, your what's your 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 one term? We would we would suck carpet. <laughs> yeah. Um you know, I think I think uh, along these lines, uh, I heard something this past week. I was down in Lynchburg, Virginia, um Monday and Tuesday, and um I heard uh from Mary DeMuth, um you know, she's She's an author, has written tons of books, um, just very brilliant. Um, got to know her, uh, know her well, and just beautiful person. Um, she talked about her and her husband going over to, to France and doing church planting. And she said, you know, we spent several years there and, and just failed miserably. She said, I mean, in every sense of the word, we utterly failed. We were complete failures. And she said, we left uh, with our tail between our legs, and and she said, uh, we were depressed, uh, we were lonely. There was no church plant. Um, you know, we walked away from that. And she said, we were just saying, God, what, what are you doing with us? And I I thought when she as she's talking, I'm like, you're describing the Macedonian call. Remember the Macedonian call when Paul has this vision, come over to Macedonia and help us. It's this pleading, and Paul. For the first time that I ever remember recorded, uh, Paul comes back and he gathers his, his other disciples and is like, what do we make of this? Um, I don't ever remember Paul really doing that, except maybe the, the council in uh, Jerusalem in Acts 15, where they all came together. Um, but Paul's like, what do you make of this? And they, they decide, well, we should go. This is God calling us. They go, they go into Philippi and what happens? Get the living tar beat out of them, right? Um, they didn't plant a church. <laughs> um, in fact, their their trip into Macedonia sparked such a manhunt that Paul and his disciples had to split up for the first time ever in in Paul's missionary journey. They had to all split up and and scatter like a bunch of cockroaches. Um, to avoid persecution because they feared that if they stayed together, um, they were going to be found. And then Paul jumps a ship by himself, and so he's kind of herded away from the rest of the, the, his team. Um, and I just thought, but God had a purpose for sending Paul into Macedonia. And so Mary came back and she said, she said, you know, we came back and it wasn't until we came back to the States that we realized that success as Christians is such an American idea. That if we're not successful, God must not have, he, we must not have been hearing God's call. Or we must have, maybe that was the devil distracting us or, and she said, it's such an American, it's such an American idea that we have to be successful. Yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that <clears throat> signifies a lack of control, right, on our part. <laughs> we can't. We can't control that. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, they didn't in Isaiah's, right? God, when God calls Isaiah, says, these people will not listen to you. Um, I want you to preach anyway. And everybody's going to reject you. Yeah, <laughs> not by our definition of successful, not at all. But they were faithful. And, uh, and, and you see... You know, hundreds of years after Isaiah's dead and gone, you start to see the first fruits of of his ministry. And so Jesus is quoting Isaiah left and right. Um, in fact, Jesus' ministry is basically uh, the the foundation of that ministry is is the law, uh, the law of Moses and Isaiah. Um, it's incredible. Okay, chapter 24. Um, the whole earth is going to be emptied and plundered except for, it's this theme of the remnant that keeps coming up again. Uh, the remnant's job was not to have a, a super powerful, awesome, rocking out worship experience where everybody just leaves with their batteries full so that they can go out the rest of the week and just handle all the mean things that bullies say to them. That wasn't the point of the remnant. <laughs> um, the remnant was to be faithful and to bring honor and glory to God in everything, period. Um, so you, you find this theme of the remnant over and over and over and over. So chapter 24, start in verse 1. Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. Uh, I think this is, at least in my mind, um, this brings you back to uh, Genesis 6. Uh, you know, you have the flood, uh, the flood narrative, uh, where God, God makes the earth desolate. Um, he wipes it out. He cleans, cleans the earth of all the wickedness, uh, and he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. As with the slave, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. In other words, everybody. Nobody's getting out of this. Um, it doesn't matter, again, your position. It doesn't matter your quote-unquote power. Uh, it doesn't matter what your prominence is or what you think it is. It doesn't matter what you make or what you don't make. Um, Everybody falls under this umbrella of God's justice. Um, verse 3, the earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the high people, the highest people of the earth languish. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. The wine mourns, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. The mirth of the tambourines is stilled, the noise of the jubilant has ceased, the mirth of the lyre is stilled. No more do they drink wine with singing. Strong drink, it's bitter to those who drink it. The wasted city is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one can enter. There's an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy has grown dark. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. And on it goes. I mean, you look at this and it's this dire picture it's the entire earth everything everything's plundered and guess what happened historically what happened the earth got plundered right 
The Assyrians come in. We're the dominant world power. We're going to come in and we're going to we're going to mess with Israel and we're going to we're going to um, take over and and we're going to establish our kingdom and we're going to exile people. And then what happened? Babylonians. Where did they come from? And they come in, and they're this dominant super world power, and they come in. And I mean, nobody could touch the Babylonians. Um, nobody. They were the superpower of the world. What happened? That's right. The Persians and the Medes, they start rising up. And then all of a sudden, they come in, and they just spank the Babylonians out of, off the page. They're, not, they're, not, they're just wiped out. <laughs> and then what happens? <laughs> right? And it on and on it goes. And then, uh, then you have the Greeks rise up. Um, and they become this dominant world power. Rome. Look at Rome in the first century. Look at the amount of power and dominance. And they came, I mean, they successfully just wiped out everybody. What happened to Rome? <laughs> right? <laughs> they, yeah. Rome who? Yeah. I mean, you just, you see it time and time and time again. And, and you know, I shudder every time I hear, well, you know, we have the strongest military in the U.S. And, you know, we've got to, we've got to, you know, and I, I agree, we've got to strengthen our military. But, guys, I'm here to tell you right now, the strongest military in the world isn't going to protect us. <laughs> it's just not. Um, no, that's right. No. And so all these, all these people are looking to Washington as their savior. We're looking in the wrong place. Um, I think God's pretty clear. Uh, then, then he comes back, uh, Isaiah comes back. He says, the earth staggers and falls forever. Um, Verse 19, the earth is utterly broken. The earth is split apart. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It, it sways like a hut. Its, transgressions, its, its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls, and it will not rise again. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Again, it, this is we're not even talking in, in, the, in the earthly realms, in the earthly kingdoms. This is everywhere. God is supreme over everything and every one, even in the heavenly places. And then we can get into all kinds of fun stuff there because... Well, I thought in the heavenly places it's supposed to be nothing but peace and, you know, and joy and people bowing down, saying, holy, holy, holy is, is the Lord God Almighty. And then you look in Ephesians 6, and that just shatters all of that. And then, you know, it says um, there's all this spiritual warfare being waged, and, and people are just rising up, and, and it's just this big, powerful mess. And then Paul throws in this one little wrench into the spokes of our, our pristine little box that we put God in, in the heavenly places. Isn't that a fascinating phrase? Because we're always like, man, watch out for those evil people out there. Out there. Paul's like, no, 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 no. Look for them everywhere. There's this spiritual war that's being waged all around us. And even in the heavenly places... Evil has infiltrated that, and they're they're in there, and the angels are fighting, and there's just this this unseen world. Um, I don't know if any of you ever read this present darkness. Um, fantastic, uh, of course it's a fiction work, but um, man, it's just so powerful that 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 vision of all around it right now, all around us, angels are just slaying each other. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And we just, so we're so ignorant because we're like, man, if we don't see it, it's, you know, the he oh, we all want to go to the heavenly places where it's calm and joyful. And, and the Bible paints this picture where 
there's just there's evil everywhere and God but God is supreme over it and God is in control of it all and God God is taking care of it and so we don't have to like bite our fingernails and huddle in fetal position in the corner God's taking care of it um, but we better be standing behind it as Christians and praying our little hearts out um, and and we better be honoring God with our lives period Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can't get away from it. I mean, in Revelation, um, y you know, we could get into all kinds of fun stuff. What what does the Bible mean by heavenly places? Um, how do you even begin to break that down? Well, I think there's a lot uh, a lot that we don't know. Uh, but clearly in, in, in Revelation, in Daniel too, uh, you get this picture of... Um, of, of saints being so protected um, and they are bowing down and I don't think once we get to heaven we're like we're gonna be dodging bullets and you know like I don't think we're gonna be what is this place <laughs> you know I don't get that picture in scripture I think it's gonna be fantastic I think it's gonna be beyond anything that we could ever even begin to imagine here on this earth I don't think there are words there are not emotions that are built into us where we can even begin to comprehend how awesome and incredible it is to be in the presence of God 24 7 and to have our master our maker our Savior um, our Creator, uh, to have Him right filling the room that we're in and we're bowing down and we're singing in unison um, and saying, yes, <laughs> yes you will. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the veil is removed and I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic, but I think we're we're so misled if we think that there's not this spiritual warfare that's being waged even in the heavenly places. It, it's, I mean, it's all around us. And, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, there, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament. It's all through. There's just tons. And then, of course, Peter gets into some really funky stuff with, you know, um, some of these forces being being in chains and, you know, just bizarre stuff. Um, but it, God, is, God is supreme over all of it. Um, there is no place, no thing where God hasn't touched it and where God is not absolutely supreme uh, and in control of it. And I think we've got to stop turning God into a pansy. Uh, I, we do it as Christians. We sanitize scripture. We clean it up so much. And we're like, you know, even our prayers, God, do this if you can. And it's not what we say, but it, but if it be your will. You know, and, and, and we take the words of Jesus and we, we spin that into this cliche where we're, we're praying these like really timid prayers. Jesus is like, ask whatever you want. If you believe you've received it, it's yours. Like, stop being timid when you pray. Stop saying, if you can, if you will, maybe. Um, if, you, if you answer this prayer, then we negotiate. If you do this, I promise I'll go to church, you know, two weeks in a row, <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. Um, no, no, not at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's a that's a good point. Yes, that's happened once or twice, right? <laughs> and finally, chapter twenty-five. Uh, this is praise for God's heart for the poor and those in distress. I absolutely love this chapter. Um, again, I think the uh, 
those who are oppressed and broken and lonely and in extreme poverty, poverty are the closest to God's heart. You see it all through Scripture. You cannot get away from it. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Uh, being successful as Christians is an American idea. Well, gee, where's your, where's your good God for all these poor people? If you believe in this God, why is he not, why are these little kids digging in dumpsters? You kidding me? Again, I still think we asked the wrong question. Uh, a lot of people, where's, where's your God? That's not the right question. The right question, or at least a better question, is where are God's people? Where are God's people? When the little kid's digging in the dumpster, um, when, uh, when, when the person uh, is out in the middle of the street with, uh, with a needle sticking out of their arm, where are God's people? Where are God's people? I'm not, I'm not concerned with where God is. I know where God is. Where are God's people? That's right. So uh, I'll just read these verses and then we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, verses 1 through 7. <laughs> I know. Keep going. I'm already pad. I better ring that second bell. Um, so chapter 25, start in verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Isn't that an interesting response? There's all this destruction around. God, we praise you. We bring honor to your name. And we know that this is what you're going to do. You're going to raise up strong people who are going to glorify you. Notice this isn't I wonder if you'll raise up strong people from this. Or God, will you raise up? This is, no, God, uh, strong people are going to glorify you. I trust it. I know it. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor. This is the because. Because we have witnessed in our life that you care for the poor. You have a heart for the poor. You do. You desire the poor. You pursue the poor. You protect the poor. Um, you fight for the poor. You've been a stronghold to the needy in distress, a shelter from the storm and, and a shade from the heart, or from the heat, rather. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. And on this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine and well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is, that, that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. It's just such an awesome praise. And it's this confidence that, God, you are, I know that you're supreme and that your heart is after the poor and the broken, and we've witnessed it. And guys, we've got to open our eyes to it. God is no different today. God breaks for the poor. God loves the poor. Um, God just draws them close to his heart. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, fantastic. 
All right, we're going to stop there. And